It covers more than two thirds of our planet and is essential to life on Earth. But now, the ocean is fundamentally changing in ways we never expected. What's happening now is that the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is going into the ocean at least 100 times faster than any time in tens of millions of years. The problem is not just global warming. Instead, the water itself is being radically transformed and becoming more acidic. For many sea creatures, it's a lethal recipe. What's in store for the majority of life in the ocean? They can move, they can adapt, or unfortunately, they die. On the front lines of the battle, coral reefs. These spectacular natural sites could be among the first victims, unless the creatures that live here can somehow adapt. In a remote part of the world, one reef may hold the key to the future. We really hit a jackpot. This is such a scientific gold mine like nowhere else in the world. Can these scientists crack the code of a rapidly changing ocean before it's too late? We're doing an experiment on the chemistry of our oceans, which we don't know the answer to. America's Pacific Northwest has relied on the oyster trade for well over a century. It's a $250 million industry and the lifeblood for many small coastal towns. Every day, boats scour the bottom of this bay, harvesting oysters that are grown commercially from sea by farmers like Mark Weigart. His hatchery depends on seawater pumped from the bay to produce baby oysters, known as larvae. Business was booming until a few years ago. We first noticed a real solid change in 2007. We actually could not produce any larvae at all. Uh, and that definitely gets your attention. All of the larvae in the whole place were pink. They were not feeding, they looked terrible. We just knew they were all gonna die. Mark and his wife Sue struggled for months to grow little oysters. We saw a behavior in the larvae that we'd never seen before. They would circle around and then just kind of lay on the bottom. We call them lazy larvae. They'd actually dissolve in the water and we didn't know what was going on. This is a magnified image of a healthy one-day-old oyster. It's already started producing its shell. And this is what Sue was seeing in her microscope. The shell is deformed and pitted. The problem was not with the oysters, but with the pumped seawater. It was too corrosive for the baby shellfish. I think the initial reaction from a lot of people was, don't worry about the pH of the water. That's, that's never going to be a problem. It was a problem. The pH was dropping too low. pH is a standard measurement for levels of acidity in a liquid. The lower the pH, the higher the acidity. It turned out the water from the bay was a staggering six times more acidic than normal seawater. The baby oysters couldn't handle it. What we've realized about the chemistry of the water is, is it's everything. If the chemistry is not right, the larvae can die. Uh, they can stop eating. They can stop growing. Basically, you're not able to grow larvae. With the mystery solved, the hatchery has found a temporary solution to the problem. Common baking soda raises the pH back to 8.1, the normal pH level for seawater, and keeps it constant. But this can't be done for an entire ocean. And we pump 75 to 100,000 gallons a day, and that's a lot of making your own special seawater. And there's goodies in the water the larvae like that I that I don't even know about that you know Mother Nature provides. 
So how do you duplicate what they like? It's, it's a very tough question. Oceans everywhere are becoming more acidic due to increasing carbon dioxide emissions over the past 200 years. Oceanographers knew for years that carbon dioxide from the atmosphere was absorbing into the oceans. And everyone thought, oh, perfect. This is a service that the ocean is performing for us, storing the gas that we're releasing as a, it's a pollutant. It's a, it's a product of our activities. And so everybody thought, oh, this is awesome. But scientists soon realized that this service comes at a cost. The extra CO2 absorbed by the ocean is dramatically changing the water's chemistry. We're dissolving 30 million metric tons of carbon dioxide into the surface of the ocean each and every day. And that is what's driving down the pH or increasing the acidity. When carbon dioxide dissolves in seawater, it forms a dilute acid that lowers the pH and drives up acidity. This chemical change is known as ocean acidification. You put carbon dioxide in the ocean, it produces carbonic acid. That carbonic acid takes away essentially the building blocks of what plants and animals use to make calcium carbonate, making it more difficult for these animals and plants to secrete a calcium carbonate shell. Scientists now face an urgent challenge to understand what this will mean for life in the sea. Much of their focus falls on coral reefs. They are the rainforests of the sea and also the most vulnerable to environmental change. reefs occupy less than 1% of the ocean, yet provide a home for at least a quarter of all marine species. They take many years to grow, and these reefs, made out of limestone or calcium carbonate, are now thousands of years old. How will ocean acidity affect them? Corals are incredibly sensitive to high carbon dioxide conditions because they're forming a skeleton that is made out of limestone. And limestone and acid just don't go together. Dr. Katerina Fabricius from the Australian Institute of Marine Science has spent a lifetime diving on some of the world's most pristine reefs. She's very aware they are under threat. It's just one of the most amazing ecosystems in the world. And, and seeing them degrading over time is just a real shame. It's also a moral and ethical responsibility for us to, to protect the reefs for our children and our grandchildren. Katarina is determined to establish the fate of coral reefs. She's heading up a very special scientific mission to remote Papua New Guinea to study the impact of low pH, or high acidity, on coral reef ecosystems. With her, a team of experts have assembled from around the world. They have just 14 days. And they're on their way to one of the most remarkable field sites in international marine science. Its unique qualities have aroused much excitement amongst the scientific community. So this is a straight stretch on the reef flat here. You'll be able to see the bubbles from the surface. Set amongst the volcanic islands of Milne Bay lies one reef that Katerina found by accident more than a decade ago. It was just so exciting. You see the bubbles touching the corals, and the corals are not discolored, so we know the bubbles are not toxic to the corals. These gases bubbling up through the sea floor are caused by volcanic activity in the Earth's crust.
samples revealed it was pure carbon dioxide, which was lowering the water's pH and making it more acidic. I realized maybe we can use that as a natural laboratory to investigate how emerging CO2 and high carbon dioxide levels are changing the conditions for the corals. So I thought, bingo, that's it, we gotta go back. We're going to the site Ili Ili Pua Pua, which is the best bubble site we've got. Katarina and her team are now into their fourth year of study at the only naturally acidic coral reef site in the world. My hope is very high that these guys here are cracking it and producing the world-class science that is so needed to understand ocean acidification. So I'd probably first jump in and have a look around. Dr. Leticia Plaisance, a fellow at the Smithsonian, has surveyed coral reefs all over the world, but it's her first time in Papua New Guinea. She's investigating how the high acidity might be affecting the biodiversity of the small reef-dwelling creatures. Well, the plan is actually to have my first look at uh, this uh, amazing bubbly site. So I'm quite excited because I don't know really what to expect. The bubbles emerging from the cracks in the shallow seafloor are known as seeps. They've been bathing these corals in a constant source of carbon dioxide for nearly a century. The water chemistry here is now identical to what's predicted for much of the ocean in 60 to 80 years' time. Only a few coral species now grow in this almost lunar landscape. These super tolerant corals are called porites. They have large, thick skins and now dominate the reef. The colourful branching corals and soft corals that are abundant in most coral reefs are gone. In this area alone, coral diversity has been reduced by nearly 40%. And even the tough porites are showing signs of wear and tear in the high acidity. It's very amazing when you get closer to the very intense sea, how the landscape totally changes and the reef loses its colour, loses its fish. And actually at some point there was only sand and nothing was living around it. For Katarina, the conditions here are a snapshot of what will happen to coral reefs around the world if carbon emissions continue to rise. At the most intense seeps, we are probably looking into the next century, like 2100. Coral reefs cannot grow any longer, and we call it a death zone. It's really only algae and sponges left. And what we are seeing is the structural corals are all missing in the high CO2 world. The condition of this coral is poor. But just 50 metres away from the bubbling vents, the reef starts to improve. By 100 metres away, the reefs are some of the richest on the planet. Coral gardens of Papua New Guinea are famous for their biodiversity and are home to more than 500 species of coral and hundreds of thousands of tiny creatures. Much of this could be lost as the ocean acidifies. Everything is a balance in the ocean. The reef is made of calcifying organisms, so that means they need higher pH to be able to build their skeleton. And this skeleton then provides the structure of the reef where 
all the other associated species can find shelter and they can mate and they can feed and they can hide in that structure. When the pH is lower, this structure starts to dissolve. With just two weeks to get the work done, the team gets started. Each of us is focusing on two or three different projects. I'm looking at how the conditions for corals is changing. That is stuff we cannot do in the laboratory. Here, hopefully, some organisms have gotten used to the high carbon dioxide concentrations, which would be a good thing because it would tell us that maybe there is a future for coral reefs after all. There are two study sites, 200 meters apart. These will be cross-referenced. This is the control site, where the conditions and pH of the water are normal. And this is the centre of the high acidity bubble site. Corals are actually animals, but they're glued to the ground like a plant is. They're not able to pack their bags and move to another site if the conditions is no good for them. So they need well-lit, clear waters, no competition with algae. And if all of those conditions are, are okay, then you find coral reefs like you do here. The study sites are busy. The scientists have the latest high-tech instruments to measure water temperature, currents and pH. The experiments will aim to discover how corals are coping in these more acidic waters. Which ones are doing well and which ones have disappeared? Do corals grow faster or slower in the high acidity? To test this out, the team collects corals far away from the high CO2 bubbles where the conditions are normal. So the idea first is to get colonies, split them in half, half goes into high CO2 areas and half into the control sites. This is all one organism, but like a plant having individual leaves, um, the corals have individual polyps that are feeding separately from each other. They can share the food, but each polyp can respond to a plankton touching its tentacles and grabbing it. Once they're digesting it, um, they're spreading the juices across the colony. While Katerina studies the impact of high acidity on living coral, Letizia looks at what happens after they die. I'm on my way to find a coral head, a nice dead coral head in a low pH location. Living coral heads provide homes for tiny fish and many other species. Once they die, their calcium carbonate structure remains. And just like a dead tree, new creatures move in. Leticia wants to compare what's living in these dead coral heads from both the control and the high CO2 bubble sites. that I noticed with this coral head is that it's covered with uh, this type of algae. And the problem really is that this type of algae does not hold much diversity, which I'm used to see in other sites where the pH is, is much higher. One predicted outcome for a more acidic ocean is a drop in species diversity and an increase in algae or seaweed living on the reef. Although this chunk of coral is now dead, inside it are many living things. I'm searching for the crabs and the mollusk, and here is a little ophiurid. 
trying to escape. Another sea cucumber, I think, here. All part of a food chain. And if you miss a link in the chain, the rest of the chain can continue, can't go on. So yes, all those little, pretty insignificant species are extremely important. Letizia is taking DNA samples, which will be analysed later to see what differences exist amongst the myriad of small creatures at both sites. We use DNA because it's faster than traditional methods that are based on studying all the morphology, the colour pattern, all the features of the species. The team works around the clock in all kinds of weather. Some days, nothing goes to plan. I think that some problem is one of the generators, one of the exhaust pipes had a bit of a breakdown. Underwater conditions are difficult. This site we have massive rocks, so it's really hard to drill inside this structure. We managed to attach three out of six. And even the coral experiments have become dinner for some hungry snails. At least 50% of little coral branches we made had been eaten by these snails. Yeah, not happy. We are very limited in time. Experiments by nature quite often fail. It's requiring a lot of patience. But eventually we'll sort it out and we'll find some other ways to test the same questions. Science is pretty much like a detective story. We want to know why are certain organisms quite happy and abundant at the high CO2 sites and why others are missing. This isn't the first time the planet has undergone major environmental change. When you look back in time, there are periods where there was a sudden change in environment and 90% of species went extinct. And these are referred to mass extinction events, and there's been five of them. And at least four of them seem to be associated with a rise of CO2, possibly from volcanic activity. Fossil records show that when there were spikes in carbon dioxide, the Earth's climate changed and coral reefs disappeared for millions of years. The most famous extinction was 65 million years ago, when the dinosaurs disappeared. But 250 million years ago, 96% of all marine life died when the Permian era ended. And whilst it remains unclear what caused the increase in carbon dioxide, it is clear it led to global warming, a dramatic drop in oxygen, and ocean acidification. It took millions of years before coral reefs returned and new marine species evolved. Well, many people talk about us entering now the sixth mass extinction. And I think in many ways they're right. We're doing things actually faster than in the past. More atmospheric carbon dioxide is now going into the ocean than at any time in the last tens of millions of years. The rate of change is happening much, much faster than these plants and these animals can adapt. You can't just remove coral reefs and, you know, have all the different resident species say, oh, okay, well, I'm just gonna go over here instead. Unless it happens at a much, much slower rate, evolution will not have an opportunity to keep up with the change. It's not only coral reefs that are in jeopardy. Cold water absorbs more carbon dioxide. 
so the Arctic and Antarctic seas will become acidic more quickly. What's at stake are key species that also rely on calcium carbonate to build their shells and skeletons. On a cold winter's day in a Swedish fjord, a million dollar experiment is underway. Giant test tubes the size of a two-story house are being lowered into the water, sealed, and then pumped with carbon dioxide to mimic future conditions. And the big question we have here is, is our planet now changing so rapidly that organisms will not be able to adapt, particularly in terms of ocean acidification. We have no records from the past how fast adaptation can go for this. After five months in the sea, results reveal that the main creatures thriving in the high CO2 are minuscule plants called picoplankton. Sadly, these hungry microbes gobble up critical nutrients that are normally available to larger plankton species that, in turn, provide food for fish. As a result, they alter the food chain. Aboard the Aurora Australis, the Australian Antarctic Division's research vessel, scientists are also studying tiny plankton, some the size of a pinhead. Dr Donna Roberts has spent much of her working life in the Southern Ocean. If you took a drop of water from the Southern Ocean, there are millions of life forms in it. And you might think, well, so what? Why do I care about a Southern Ocean microbe? Well, actually, if you breathe or if you eat, you should care about a Southern Ocean microbe because there's a plant called a coccolithophore that's actually got a little shell that's being eaten away by the CO2 we're putting into the ocean. And every second breath you take is produced from sea plants. Coccolithophores are vulnerable as they have a shell. And as well as producing oxygen, these miniature plants have another important job. When they make their intricate calcium carbonate shells, they are contributing to the global carbon cycle. Without these tiny calcifiers, less CO2 would be transported to the deep ocean, leaving more of it in the atmosphere. Donna's favourite plankton are pteropods. These tiny, almost transparent sea snails swarm in vast numbers in the Southern Ocean, feeding whales, fish, and ultimately, us. The pteropod shells are gorgeous. It's just like a garden snail, but instead of having one slimy foot, it's evolved to live in the ocean with wings. Scientists call pteropods the potato chips of the sea because they're meaty and a lot of things eat them, but they've got that added little crunch. Tucked away in this cold room at the University of Tasmania, are pteropod samples from Antarctica. They date back to 1997. Donna's task is to analyse their shell weight to see if rising acidity has affected them. It does matter if a little organism is losing weight because it's a measure of how healthy they are. So if their shells become thin, then they're going to put more of their energy towards building what little shell they can than reproducing. Pteropod shells collected today are 35% smaller and more fragile than those caught a decade ago. Yet another sign of rising ocean acidity. This is a healthy set of shells that we collected in 2002, and I'll just show you for comparison what unhealthy shells look like. So you can see this one here has lost a segment of shell, and this one here is incredibly thin, very paper thin. Shells like this often fall apart in my hand when I'm trying to weigh them. Like the baby oysters, scientists say there'll soon come a point at which the levels of carbon dioxide will be too great for these beautiful little sea butterflies. Most people have not heard of what a pteropod is, but they are vastly important. They're holding up the entire Southern Ocean food web in places.
thousands of plankton species, like pteropods, feed fish across the world, from the poles to the tropics. If they disappear, not only will fish be in trouble, but so will every other species that depends on them for food. Five hundred million people rely on coral reefs for their survival. Few have any idea how rising acidity will affect the fish living here. Back in Papua New Guinea, fish ecologist Dr. Danielle Dixon from the School of Biology at the Georgia Institute of Technology is on an urgent mission. In the final week left of the expedition, she's joining the team. Until now, she's mainly studied fish in the laboratory. It's really good to study fish in that way because you can really control it. I know that I'm only testing the effect of ocean acidification on the sensory system or their auditory system or just their general behavior. But the thing about this location that makes it really, really interesting is that these fish have been living in this CO2 situation for a very long time. You can see where the CO2's coming up there. Yeah, so that's the CO2 seep site and the controls up here. You can just see the Working with Danielle there, is Professor Philip Munday from James Cook University. They've been collaborating together for five years now. When they treated fish with high CO2 in the laboratory, the results were alarming. This time, the impact was not on the fish's skeleton, but on key survival instincts. What we do see that's really dramatic is the changes in their behaviour. So things like how they respond to chemical cues in the water changes, their preference for turning left or right in the tank changes, uh, their response to sound changes. And what's really cool here is that we can come to these seeps, we can see fish that have probably been living for months, maybe even years under a high CO2 environment and see if their behaviour is still affected. Danielle will compare the behaviour of the fish living both near and far from the high CO2 bubbles. First, she'll test their sense of smell. Baby fish in particular have very good noses. It's not on the end of their face, but they have nostrils and water comes in and there's sensory cells inside the nostril and then water goes back out. Very much the same as we do. Smell is critical for all fish. They use it to catch food, find their way home, and even to sense danger. There's a lot of things in the water that produce a lot of smell. The corals themselves indicate habitat for small fish, but they're also releasing chemical cues. There's predators in the water that are trying to feed. There's prey in the water that things are trying to feed on. Pretty much everything has uses chemistry underwater. So, uh, yeah, reefs would be a pretty smelly place. Before they can start, the team must collect some fish. They're very easy to catch. Just a little bit of clove oil, and then you can use your hand to waft them out of the coral, grab them in a net. Next, they must catch a predator fish. I'll just hop over. You can handle that. Dr. Yeah. Jody Rummer is a fish physiologist. She studies how fish have evolved and are adapting to be better athletes in their environment. So I got a fish. Just as on land, where animals can identify the presence of predators by their smell, the same occurs underwater with fish. This fish is going to be used to make predator odor. I'm just going to soak it in some water and then the cues from the fish will come out in the water and I'll be able to test little fish to see if they can identify the predator cues over other cues. Danielle sets up an unusual experiment. 
water with the predator odour is being pumped into the top side of the flume. The bottom side has normal offshore seawater. The fish that we have in the flume right now is taken from the control reef where no CO2 bubbles are happening. The fish identifies the predator through smell alone and stays in the offshore water side where no predator smell is. The next fish has grown up in the more acidic waters of the CO2 bubble site. Now the fish is sitting in the water that has the predator scent. We've found that the CO2 is affecting the fish's cognitive ability, so it can identify the smell of a predator. But if something's wrong with its brain, then it's having a hard time identifying it as a bad thing. It's just identifying the smell. Danielle tests dozens of fish, and the results are worrying. The higher acidity seems to be scrambling the fish's brain, changing its behavior and chances of survival. As the fish team continue their tests, Katerina looks at why there are so few young corals at the high CO2 site. Fourteen months ago, she placed over 100 blank tiles at her study sites. Just in time for the annual coral spawning. This is one of the greatest natural events on Earth. The corals synchronise with the lunar cycles and each other, releasing billions of eggs and sperm, often on the same night. Within a few days, the tiny coral larvae must find the right place to call home. Will these baby corals settle on Katerina's blank tiles? Now, she'll find out. Okay. The first tiles are from the control site. They're looking fantastic. All the pink colour is coral and algae, which are really important for the health of the reefs. This pink algae is the cement of the reef. Young corals are genetically programmed to zero in on it as it provides a strong foundation for their growth. But it's also made of calcium carbonate and will dissolve even faster than the corals if the pH drops too low. Katerina now moves to the high acidity bubble site. It takes hours to see exactly what's growing on the tiles. The ones from the control site, where acidity is low, have cultivated a healthy batch of young corals. The tiles from the control site already have got a fair number of large coral colonies established. A baby coral settled on the edge here is growing quite happily. So that's about one year old. Coralline algae here, the pink stuff. There's a speck here. There's one sitting here right at the edge. I found up to 19 coral settlers on this very small space. Not all of them will survive, but still, it's a very good for the coral reefs to establish. The tiles from the high CO2 bubble site tell a different story. We found hardly any coral recruits on them. There's no pink left, no coralline algae. We are getting a lot of seaweed that are occupying the space for coral to settle. The fact that there are so few coral recruits is of real concern. I didn't expect the differences to be so stark. 
While CO2 levels can adversely affect sensitive marine organisms like coral, it can also bring unexpected benefits. This rich supply of carbon dioxide at the Papua New Guinea bubble site is fertilising these seagrass beds, turning them into a thick lawn. Seagrasses can live in very high CO2 environments. They actually like it because seagrasses, like the terrestrial plants, they do take in the carbon dioxide and convert it into sugars. The lush seagrass appears to be an important nursery for baby fish. Once they mature, some migrate to the corals for shelter. Cardinal fish are pretty cool because they will always come back to the same coral, and not only the same coral, they'll always come back to the same spot in the coral. It's like they have their own little parking garage. Beyond their coral homes lie many dangers. These fish are like candy on the reef. They really like to be eaten. It is in their best interest to be closer to the habitat so that they can retreat back to it and they're not picked off as much by predators. Danielle has already discovered that the CO2 fish have trouble smelling predators. Now she's conducting a test to see which fish will hide from them. This one is from the control site where the conditions are normal. You can see it retreats right into the coral. It might be exploring the habitat of the coral, but it's not really exploring the tank. The fish will stay like this for the entire trial in general. The next fish comes from the high CO2 bubble site. You can see it's checking out the water a lot. It's going quite far from the coral. It's not really retreating back into the coral. So being bolder could make you grow faster and get bigger, but it also makes you a lot more susceptible to predators. Danielle trials several fish. They all follow the same pattern. The fish seem to have no fear because the high acidity is disrupting their brain signals. Right. Left. Left. More and more little fish are tested under varying conditions. But there are glimmers of hope that some fish are adapting to the higher levels of CO2. Some even seem to thrive amidst the carbon dioxide bubbles. Well, we've been seeing these three-spot damsel fishes swimming into these high CO2 cracks. Uh, I don't think that they're living in there, but they do seem to be using them as a refuge and hanging out until the scientist or the predator goes away. It seems that these fish living around the bubbles have become stronger in order to cope with the high acidity. There are mechanisms that might allow them to adjust to a high CO2 world. Some individuals will have better genes for that particular environment, so they pass their genes on and you get genetic adaptation. Signs of genetic adaptation to a rapidly acidifying ocean of a holy grail for the global science community. Clues can be found wherever there are variable levels of ocean acidity. On the west coast of America, from Washington State down to California, there's a seasonal upwelling of carbon dioxide from the deep ocean. Professor Gretchen Hoffman from the University of California in Santa Barbara has chosen this coastline as her study site. One thing that's unique about the California coast here is that we have upwelling. And this is where wind blows across the surface of the ocean starting in the springtime. And this wind brings up deep, cold, CO2-rich water to the shores. And that water has a really low pH. And this low pH water has an impact on the biology on the shores. One creature that seems to have adapted to the ocean's variable acidity here is the spiky red sea urchin. They are the lawnmowers of the sea. 
They play a vital role in keeping ecosystems healthy by devouring algae and seaweed. Without them, these sea plants would multiply and damage the ecosystem. Unlike the oysters, which were struggling in the high acidity of the northwest coast, the sea urchin seems to be flourishing. Oh, it looks great. It looks really good. Gretchen believes the key to its success may lie in its genes. We found that populations, say from the north in Oregon, that are really tougher in the face of these pH changes, they were expressing genes in a different way than sort of the wimpy Californian urchins were, that they were turning on more genes that would help them make their skeleton. By turning on certain genes, the northern sea urchins became more efficient at building their calcium carbonate shells, even when the surrounding water had higher acidity. Gretchen wondered if this life-saving gene could be passed on to the more vulnerable urchins in the south. Five spots, that looks great. To find out, she sets up a cross-breeding experiment. The sperm from both northern and southern males is used to fertilise eggs from the weaker southern females. Once the larvae begins to mature, Gretchen compares the two samples. Now we're interested in measuring their skeleton. And the way I think about a sea urchin larvae is that it's like a freestanding backpacking tent. So the skeleton are actually like the tent poles. That's the thing that's made of calcium carbonate. And that's part of their body that could be challenged to form under ocean acidification conditions. Amazingly, the experiment reveals that the northern urchin's tolerance to high acidity is passed on genetically to the southern female's young larvae. What we've learned is that larvae that have fathers from the northern populations actually um, retain their body size. They stay bigger even in the face of low pH. So it does matter who your daddy is in this kind of experiment. We know now that there are populations that have genetics that will allow them to adapt, and we know how to look for them. While it's good news that one species is adapting to changing conditions... Nice looking eggs. It's only one species. And one species will never save an entire ecosystem. Back at base, at the Smithsonian Institution in Washington, D.C., Leticia is analysing the DNA samples collected in Papua New Guinea. She finds that the highest species diversity was at the control site where the pH is a normal 8.2. She then analyses the samples collected halfway between the control and the high CO2 bubble site. As the acidity increases, the corals start to disintegrate. Because you have less uh, coral heads, less uh, structure habitat, then a lot of diversity tends to uh, try to find shelter in it. So it's still quite diverse. And then the low pH, which was 7.9 in my study, you have almost nothing. Similar to the corals, one or two species are tolerating the high acidity but the rest have disappeared. And so you have the same kind of shrimp a hundred times, when in the regular pH conditions you have a hundred different species. Leticia's DNA barcoding results are disturbingly clear. The high CO2 site has 30% less diversity of small sea creatures than the control site. The reason why this group is very important is because it's the basis of the food chain in coral reef. The fish feed on those tiny creatures. So if those tiny creatures disappear, the fish community is going to change and evolve as a result of this loss. In Papua New Guinea, the expedition's nearly over. The locals are concerned about the future of their coral reef. Uh, how does this carbon dioxide concentration affect the corals in the sea? 
It, the coral reefs will still be there in 50 or 100 years time, but they will look very different, is our prediction. There will be less of those branching corals and there will be po possibly less fish as well, which is of real concern because it's important for food. With coral reefs already vanishing at a rate of 1 to 2 per cent every year, finding a solution is critical. There's no way to save coral reefs without stopping greenhouse gas emissions. I mean, there, there is absolutely no practical solution to protect coral reefs from warming and from ocean acidification if we don't stop carbon dioxide emissions in the world. Some people will say, look, this is just too big, we can't do anything about it. Well, that's just not true. We've got alternative technology. The problem is that we're not willing to invest in the future. We're still worried about the spot price of gas and coal, as opposed to the long-term benefits of not destroying the planet. The question becomes, if it's not working here, do you move your farm or do you move your hatchery? It's not that simple. Let's just say you move somewhere else that doesn't have a problem. Uh, I think it's going to catch up with you and eventually have to face a problem anyway. <laughs>